this phone just right there. How's that? You guys can see me. Okay, ow, that hurt. That ceiling is pretty close. Anyway, Janet, welcome in from South Carolina. How's everybody doing? Today is Thursday, April 11th, 2024. I'm Chris, live in central Pennsylvania with a mobile edition here on my break, coming out to share some news with you all from around the world. How are folks doing in Ireland, in the United Kingdom, over in China, Andre Jacobs, Peter down in New Zealand and others, as well as folks in Australia, like Alter Bridge. Here in the United States and all around the world, the United Kingdom, we mentioned Fleshen, uh, Viking Boar in Dublin. How is everyone doing? And folks in Namibia, Botswana, and South Africa, everyone around the world. Lori Leitinen up there in Finland. How are you all doing? Busy week for all. It has been a very busy week for me, Debbie. Uh, once again, up until about midnight working on things. And then again, up again this morning about 5.30, trying to get some things out the door. I did finalize um, my secret weapon for election day. Uh, I finalized my mailer weapon and I finalized my um, poll volunteer weapon. <laughs> They're not really weapons. They're just all tools to hopefully get us over the top for what's coming very soon. But uh, the election is just around the corner here in Pennsylvania, April 23rd. And one way or the other, I'll be glad that we've gotten to that date. Initially, I was frustrated because it seemed like such a short period of time. But now it seems like it's been a marathon and I'll be glad it's over. So um, just uh, a bit of news today. Former National Football League star running back for the Buffalo Bills and later for the San Francisco 49ers. Hall of Famer, actor, broadcaster. O.J. Simpson, Ornithal James Simpson, has passed away at the age of 76, also a convicted felon, guilty of kidnapping and also other serious crimes. O.J. Simpson, who was acquitted in the most famous trial of the 20th century, other than perhaps the Lindbergh baby kidnapping, he has died at the age of 76 from cancer. The former star running back, who was accused of having murdered his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and uh, the gentleman named Goldman, I believe it was, back in the 1990s. O.J. Simpson is gone. Nicole Brown was there for her when she died. Still so sad for her. Yep. So, um, he's gone. Heisman Trophy winner at the University of Southern California. Hall of Famer. Of course, a, um, a B-rated actor for things like The Naked Gun and other um, movies like that, comedies back in the day. The Anti-Defamation League here in the United States has graded 85 American universities for their policies to protect Jewish students from anti-Semitism on campus. Harvard, surprise, surprise, not. And 12 other schools got an F. For those who don't know the American grading system, that's the worst grade you could possibly get. A failing grade, hence the word, the letter F. A is the best grade for the exceptional level. Only two schools out of 85 received an A for how they protect Jewish students on campus. Those schools were Brandeis and Elon. Now, Brandeis, 35% of the student body is Jewish, so it's hardly a surprise that Brandeis would actually take the time to consider protecting Jewish students. Now, there's always been anti-Semitism coming from Anglos and others towards Jews. Sadly, it's the history of um, the, the faith, the people, the way they abuse Jews. But uh, the anti-Semitism that's really sparked its ugly head in America is because consequence of America allowing unrestrained, unconstrained immigration of Muslim Arabs in the country since the 1980s. Uh, some of whom have a penchant for anti-Semitism and are now prevalent all over our college campuses and our society. The likes of Ilyan Omar and, of course, uh, Rashida Tlaib, who is the offspring of Palestinians who we generously allowed to come study at our universities and stay here. And now we're stuck with Rashida Tlaib as a consequence of that, who hates America and obviously Jews. Iowa takes a firm stand against the lawless Biden regime. Governor Kim Reynolds has signed into law a bill that makes it a crime to be in the state of Iowa after being deported from the United States, denied admission to the United States, or having an outstanding deportation order against you. This will take effect on July 1st of 2024. Iowa takes a stand like Texas did. Texas law is currently uh, frozen under a court order, which is utter nonsense. Courts upholding lawlessness. Their job is to uphold the rule of law. But the corrupt captured democratically stuffed courts in this country. It's just unbelievable. Well, pro-lawless groups like the Iowa Migrant Movement for Justice. Now, isn't that funny? Migrant Movement for Justice. How about you move elsewhere as a migrant? Yeah, they oppose the bill. Now, this is what they had to say on their website with release. Good morning. With all, with all any has been in the U.S. way before Arab folks. Menashe Kwa, apparently you didn't listen to what I said. 
You didn't listen to what I said. There's no reason to say all due respect to me. I clearly stated before the influx of Arab Muslims. I didn't say Arabs. I said Arab Muslims, a specific group of Muslims. We have Indonesian Muslims in this country. We have American naturalized Muslims. Or we have American born Muslims who've converted. I did not say what you think you heard. Go back and listen to tape again. I clearly said there's always been anti-Semitism in the Anglo community. That would be white boys like me, not anti-Semitic, not, not anti-Semitic, anti but that community has always had anti-Semitism. Always. It's a small number, but it's always existed. I followed it up by saying that this has been demonstrably increased since the... Ah, you came in later. See, that's always important, Menage a Croix, to catch the whole story. I followed that up by saying that since the 1980s, because we've generously allowed a massive influx of Arab Muslims into the country, many of them are anti-Semitic in nature. And that's a statement of fact. It's simply not debatable. Rashida Tlaib, Ilyan Omar. Of course, Ilyan Omar is actually Somali, not technically an Arab. But what are the cases? So, folks, catch the whole story. See, now, menage a means no malicious intent, but that's what the leftists do. They steal content, they steal copyrighted content, and they make clips of it, and then they distort what people say. They've did it, done it to Trump for years, and it happens all the time. Anyway, so this pro-lawless group in Iowa, the Iowa Migrant Movement for Justice, protested the bill. Now, they say, we know that we all belong here in Iowa. Iowa is home. And we will stand together as working families and allies to defend each other. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the Rio Grande River is the southern border of the United States, and it's much more defensible terrain. What I suggest that the Iowa Migrant Movement for Justice do is retreat to a defensible position south of the Rio Grande and then take your stand. <laughs> so they also go on to say welcoming immigrants and refugees is the definition of what Iowa nice should be. What the hell is Iowa nice? I lived in Iowa. I've never heard of Iowa nice. Is that something new? Governor Reynolds is failing newly arrived and long-term Iowans. Newly arrived. Notice that the statement doesn't say recent residents because they'd be lawful. It doesn't say long-term residents or even mention the term citizen. Newly arrived is code for criminal alien invaders who violated our sovereignty and broke into our country. Don't respect our laws, don't respect us, and take advantage of Americans like that clown from Venezuela who was telling people to occupy homes and now in detention finally after being embarrassed ICE was by the New York Post while this clown did TikTok videos telling people how to defraud Americans, how to get free things, and telling people they were fools if they didn't take advantage of a broken system. Now, make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, our immigration system is not broken. What is broken is the application of the rule of law here and the handouts given to people. All right, so... Now, this response, in response to this, in response to Iowa passing this law, sorry about that, the moment I'm reading a book, Money Kings by Daniel Schumacher talks about this. No, no, don't worry, man, man, that's quite, don't apologize. I didn't take offense. I'm just making it clear because that appear, chat appears in the stream and I want people who watch this video after the fact, if they tune in later, zip ahead to not see that I didn't say, I want to make sure they know what I said. So, in response, an unfriendly Mexican regime has threatened to interfere in the affairs of a sovereign U.S. state located 1,783 miles from the border with Mexico. So Mexico has stated that they will interfere in the domestic affairs of a sovereign state within the United States, Iowa, which is 1,783 miles from Mexico. That's the northern border of Mexico. That's not even Mexico City. It's 2,600 miles from Mexico City. What right does Mexico have to interfere, intercede into the domestic affairs of Iowa? It's one thing to threaten interference into the domestic affairs of the United States as a nation. It's quite another to tell people that you are going to interfere in the legal process of the state of Iowa. Who do they think they are? And by the way, when did Mexico get the right to intercede, intercede into the domestic affairs of a sovereign state in Iowa over Senegalese? Tajiks or Venezuelans. Ostensibly, the only possible diplomatic interest they could possibly have would be for Mexican citizens. But once again, this whole nonsense is being conflated. People conflate criminal alien invaders with Mexicans. Mexicans coming across our border are only a portion of the people who are violating our sovereignty and invading. And see, people get away with this stupidity because they call people xenophobes and racist, erroneously, maliciously, and falsely. There are Germans, there are 
Bosnians, there are Russians, there are probably no Finns, but there are people from all over the world who are sliding across our border because it is a free-for-all. It's not about Mexicans. It's not about Venezuelans, not about Haitians. It's about criminal alien invaders who don't respect our laws and invade our country and then impose upon us things that they want. Unbelievable. What right does Mexico have to interfere in the affairs of Iowa? It's cheeky, 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 cheeky. Well, Vietnamese real estate, this is pretty drastic here, folks. Pretty drastic here. Check this out. Hey, Ulrich Fenta. This is, I'll tell you what, boy, you know, I think Bernie Madoff got off easy. Um, Ken Flower went to jail for the Enron thing. Uh, it's, look, but yeah, tell you what, being a business might not be such a great idea. Vietnamese real estate tycoon Truong Mai Lan has been sentenced to death in a $12.46 billion financial fraud case. She was found guilty of embezzlement, bribery, and violations of banking rules. So she embezzled. She bribed officials, and she violated banking rules. And for that, she will be executed. Wow. That's some serious stuff there, folks. You don't mess around with Vietnamese. Now, there were 84 defendants in this case. Wow. My goodness. That were all sentenced in the case. This included her husband, who got nine years in prison, and her niece, who got 17 years in prison for her corruption. But Trong Mai Lan will be executed by the government of Vietnam. Hundreds of uh, Vietnamese def offenders have been executed by the communist government in recent years. 26-year-old Savion, Savion Johnson, a member of the Texas National Guard, was arrested and charged with human smuggling after a high-speed chase along the border. So we have members of the Texas National Guard who are now colluding, well, maybe not colluding, but simply doing the same thing that the corrupt Biden regime is doing, facilitating the criminal alien invasion of America. You can't trust soldiers? Wow, this is pretty sad. This is the state of affairs we are in America. Now, ladies and gentlemen, for news of South Africa, let me tell you, I've never stolen even a needle, and I did not finish my two terms as president of the Republic of South Africa. Jay-Z, Jacob Zuma, out there trying to hoodwink the voters of Johannesburg, trying to tell them he's not a criminal, one guy steals money and hides it in the country under his mattress and nobody charges him with a crime. But poor me, Jacob Zoom, the illiterate. Uh, is he a, was Jay-Z a garden boy? No, he was the intel chief for um, Kultui Seasway. Poor Jay-Z. He's just a victim of circumstance. He didn't do anything wrong in the arms scandal. He had nothing wrong to do with the shooting of protesters and strikers at Maracana. He had nothing to do with the insurrection of 2021. Poor Jay-Z, just a victim of circumstance. Nothing to do with the Zondo Commission's state capture investigation. Jay-Z is just an innocent bystander. So if he's such a bystander, he's probably not capable of serving government. That would be my argument. But I've never stolen even a needle. Who steals needles, man? You didn't steal a needle. You stole billions of dollars. Billions and billions of dollars. Yep. Well, hmm. So Songizo Zibi, former editor of Business Day newspaper, calls John Steenhuis an illiberal and divisive and talks about his comments being the worst kind of svat chva since apartheid. Wow, talk about a race-hustling black nationalist radical. This gentleman has just called the leader of the opposition party essentially a racist because Steenhuisen had the temerity to actually tell it like it is. John Steenhuisen simply said that these small parties are really just bandits. They're political mercenaries who will dance to the tune, these are my words, not John Steenhuisen's, dance to the tune of anyone who can get them past the post so they can leech off the taxpayer. Those are my words, not John Steenhuisen's. But, uh, of course, uh, Songezo Zibi, the former editor of Business Day, is out there basically calling John Steenhuisen a racist. John Steenhuisen might want to consider a criminal injury case against Mr. Songezo uh, Zibi. Just a thought, just a thought. He might want to consider that. So... Yep, yep, political mercenaries is what he's called parties like the Patriotic Alliance, which now Gate McKenzie's reaching out and saying, hey, 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 DA, let's make peace, let's embrace, let's kiss, says Gate McKenzie, and defeat the ANC, that's more important. Of course, Gate McKenzie has been one of the fellow travelers with the ANC, joining coalitions with them to destroy governance in multiple locations. 
On news of the ANC dropping to just 37% in the recent poll, the RAND plummeted against the dollar yesterday, falling 1% in value. It's crazy. The RAND now going to wind up pushing north of 20 to the dollar before we see it too much longer. And Game, the big retailer, discount retailer owned by Walmart in South Africa, got to go General Wine speaking at 7. All right, well, sorry about that. Um, I didn't know he was speaking at 7. I had to start late because I was busy working. But um, Game launches a 7 Rand 99 period pack of sanitary pads to combat period poverty. A study has found that 7.7 .7 million of South Africa's 22 million women and girls who menstruate <laughs> lack the means to purchase sanitary pads. We've heard the story before of period poverty. Well, that's what we're talking about here, folks, period poverty. And a lot of low-income folks do not have the resources to buy those pads for young ladies uh, and women. And that's a pretty messy situation. Up to a third of school-age girls wind up not going to school because of their menstruation. That's unfortunate and sad, and that's really something that needs to be addressed. There's uh, a lot of ways to address that in the community. It doesn't take government, and here is an innovative way that, that GAME is trying to address it, uh, as opposed to the state giving free sanitary pads out, which I don't agree with. Uh, but yeah, it's good to see you there, Clive. Those are my notes for the news. Let me say hello to everybody here. So we got Rainier, we've got uh, Nick Muller, Janet Liddy, Debbie Moray, Slippery Pickle, Erica, uh, Marilyn Broken Shaw, Pip Jacobs, Clive, Hester, and who else? Ashley Engelbrecht. Boy, it's the usual suspects, man. Menage a Croix. Okay. And uh, Mike is in. Who else we got here? Val Cooper. Ashley Engelbrecht. Who else? Myra Page. Hendo's there. Right. Who else have I missed? Ulrich Fenter. George Steinberg. And I think we got everybody. I think team pregnancy is more of an issue than pants. Uh, well, Miss John Dawes, uh, you may very well be correct about that, uh, but we don't have 7.7 .7 million pregnant teens, thank goodness, but we do have 7.7 .7 million women and girls who do not, do not have access to sanitary pads, according to that study, that survey, that poll that was done. I've seen a number of these over the years, and it's been an issue for a long time. And there's George. Sorry, George, I didn't see the bottom there. Missed that somehow. But yeah, it's um, it's a real issue, um, and it's there are loads of donations. Of exactly. Yeah, we have to hope that they get the pads. Again, this is not something where the government should be involved. It's something that the private sector and faith-based organizations, community organizers, should be responsible for this sort of thing. This is the secret glue that holds society together, the self-regulating bodies, the self-fulfilling bodies that we voluntarily create to help us get through life and manage our affairs. And I'm talking about things like the Scouts, the Bar Association, private civic organizations in South Africa. Of course, you've got... Uh, Dr. Um, uh, Imtaz uh, Suleiman, is that something I'm on a break right now, uh, who is um, Gift to the Givers, that's another. Uh, organizations like that, of course, you've got the Reformation Society, which is an evangelical group based in the Western Cape and Rondebosch, and many other activities. These are the things that we come together and do on a voluntary basis. No one should be compelled by a government to have their resources taken and confiscated and given to someone else just because the government can do it. You know, it's, it really irritates me to pieces here when I look at all the handouts that are given from the federal government that doesn't have money, that's spending us into $2 trillion of deficit, handing out $1.16 billion to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to expand broadband internet access to 325,000 businesses, businesses and homes in Pennsylvania that don't have broadband. What kind of nonsense is that? They do it on the basis of saying, well, the businesses need this so that they can grow. Yeah. And they need to pay their share of the capital cost themselves. You shouldn't be subsidizing at a tune of $3,076 per business or home. $3,000, folks. Really? That's 57,000 Rand per person who gets broadband. Christine is here. Welcome, Christine. Unbelievable. Un and there's Garrett. I didn't see Garrett at first. That is just unbelievable. $3,076. That's just one handout. Then there's the Appalachian Regional Fund. There's money from Penn Vest. It's granted to communities for water. Arguably, that's inside the state. Discam has an outreach to supply. There you go. See, Erica? This is the corporate world doing this, not even the private sector, or not even the uh, community sector, but not government. People need to stop turning to government to solve their problems. People should solve their own problems. Lack of initiatives address issues such as menstruation, poverty, shows lack of community. Exactly right, Menashe It is lazy, it is unacceptable, and it is 
selfish for communities to let government take over private sector responsibilities. Rape and violence is a serious problem amongst the... Yes, it is. Well, it's, a, it's a, Christine, it's a serious problem in all ethnic groups. Incest is a serious problem in all ethnic groups. Nobody likes to talk about it. Nobody talks about incest, but I'll tell you what. It is rampant in Southern Africa. I can guarantee you that. Incest, fathers diddling their daughters, way too rampant. And that's white, black, and otherwise. It's not unique to any community. It is just really a sick, twisted world we live in. Um, yeah, that's that's a fact, folks. It's not made up. People never want to talk about the child abuse, sexual abuse, assault. They, it's salacious. You don't want to talk about it. I appreciate that. It's not a, a topic that you enjoy. But the reality is that if you ignore it, it simply remains and you do not protect the most vulnerable. We do have a responsibility to protect the most vulnerable in our society. That's the bottom line. Now, that sounds like a kumbaya moment from a leftist, but the reality here, ladies and gentlemen, is that society does form governments. A polity forms a government to deal with their collective interest. But we do our own work through faith-based organizations, community organizations, that we voluntarily participate in, like New Hope Ministries, located here in central Pennsylvania, a private faith-based organization that feeds thousands of central Pennsylvanians, that provides nourishment for many people who do not have the means. They also provide many other resources for people. They're amazing. If you wonder if the pads you buy are just not put back in the show, I'm, I'm not sure where you're going with that, Marilyn. You mean the donated ones? I'm not sure. What the heck is that? Sorry. Oh, thought something broke down there. I had to check very quickly. Hey, smaller audience today, but a very good audience. 42 people here currently now. We got a late broadcast. Didn't broadcast yesterday. I did do Ronaldo. It has to be exposed because it leads to other kinds. Exactly, Christine. It must be exposed. It, it damages the development of boys and girls who are molested. It damages their outlook, their understanding of intimacy and sexual relations, and it affects their entire lives. Three wounded buffalo friends. I see you. Sorry to hear that, uh, Garrett. Uh, hang in there. And same to your friends. Prayers for them. It, it really is something that should not be ignored. None of these things should be ignored. The, the, the wholesale disrespect and arrogance of men in raping women and girls in South Africa is shocking. Rape at any time is simply morally, criminally wrong. But in South Africa, it's not just rape. It's the violent rape, the gang rape, and then the murder of the victim that you've done this to ostensibly so they can't testify against you but i mean that's dumb why 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 do south africans murder their rape victims when nobody gets prosecuted for rape i mean if you do go get prosecuted for rape if you're one of the few people in south africa who commits a rape or is accused of rape and then actually gets prosecuted which is so rare you simply just tell them that you know you weren't concerned about contracting hiv because you took a shower afterwards where did i hear that at Ooh, wouldn't that be a presidential hopeful in south africa who once upon a time said that uh, no, I didn't worry about getting HIV because I took a shower afterwards. Wow. I'll tell you what. But that's what happens when you put an illiterate idiot in charge of a nation. No, I'm not talking about Joe Biden. But we could talk about Joe Biden. I'm talking about, of course, Jacob Zuma. <laughs> but not too far behind him is the chief Palapala man himself, Cyril Ramaphosa. Boy, folks, remember, remember, remember... Do you remember the 5th of November, Guy Fawkes Day? No, I'm just kidding. Um, that's the line from, of course, uh, Guy Fawkes and from the movie. V, what a great movie V was. V, v for vengeance. But do you remember back to the end of 2017 when the African National Congress held its conference in Polokwane? Polokwane. And at the Polokwane conference, they deposed Tabu Mbeki as head of the ANC which should have been the end of the argument. There's Alter Bridge in from South Africa. They should have deposed, that should have been fine. He's out of the ANC, no longer the head of it, but under the corrupt system that South Africa has, which is not a democratic, oh, vendetta, I said for vengeance. Yeah, V for vendetta. Yeah, thank you for correcting me, Mike. Well, it also stood for vengeance. Uh, he used V, the viv, viv, vivacious, vivicus. You know, it was hilarious how he used Vs in that vexation of violence. It was what an incredible film. But back to... Um, 2017, when Tabo, or not Tabo Mbeki, you know, when Tabo Mbeki was removed and Jacob Zuma was, no, no, that's 2008, what am I saying? 2017, when Cyril, when Jacob Zuma was removed and Cyril Ramaphosa was installed as president of the ANC, and then just a short time later, just a short time later, 
Zuma resigns as president, and in February of 2018, shortly after the party conference in December of 2017, Ramaphosa becomes president. And all the fools, especially led by the corrupt legacy media like News24 in South Africa, all fell for the Ramaphoria, Ramaphoria. Look, I wasn't particularly harsh to the ANC because I was still serving the military and guarding my words, and I had a slightly different view of them back then. I was still giving them a chance, even though they're making it clear that they didn't care about governance. But if you watch my uh, South Africa's Fragile Democracy presentation as part of the great lecture uh, series back in 2018 at the Army War College, you will see that um, I said that the ANC has a chance, a chance, should they be serious about turning this around. But they weren't. And now we just expose the African National Congress for the angry, naughty children that they really are. Angry, naughty children. They are not anything but that. Anyway, but uh, as Ronaldo and I discussed yesterday, hey, come May 29th in KwaZulu-Natal, the ANC will be spanked. They are going to be hurt at the polls. Proven that by eating KFC, it will save you from death. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Shabir Sheikh and uh, Zuma have both been saved from death. Remember the life-threatening illness that uh, Jacob Zuma apparently had when he was at escort for all of about five minutes. Yeah, bring on the 29th. That's right. They will be destroyed. Ladies and gentlemen, as I predicted in November of 2021 and have stuck to my gun since then, the DA will retain control of the Western Cape. it probably be around 53 to 56%. I think it'll come in at 53. They will, in coalition with other partners, unseat the ANC in Gauteng province. And now the ANC or whatever he was, he was actually the head of the intelligence of MK, Jacob Zuma, they will now destroy the ANC in KZN. Meanwhile, the IFP's numbers are improving in KZN, and also, also, the DA is climbing in KZN. That's a bit of a surprise. Not a shock, but a surprise. Sorry for the buffering if you're having it, folks. I'm having a good broadcast on this end. But yeah, so... The ANC, which was the majority party in KwaZulu-Natal forever, is likely to be unseated as the top party, possibly become the third largest party, and in the worst case scenario, could fall behind MK, IFP, DA, and wind up be the fourth largest party. I don't think that's possible, but it is likely, but it's possible. Weather-related could be weather-related. It's also, don't forget, folks... Um, you know, the cables are still broken, and so data gets rerouted. You wind up with latency and delays in video in particular and broadcast. So that might be part of the problem, too. That's going to go on for months before they repair those cables off the west coast of Africa. Yeah, it was apparently um, under underwater land earthquake or, you know, tumbling of rocks that smashed the cable. So it's created a major problem. Hopefully they have ability to seal off sections of that. Undersea is spoof tactics. <laughs> spoof tactics. I don't know about that. What's this? Buff. Anyway. Yeah, so um, there you have it, folks. There you have it. The ANC is in a lot of trouble. Uh, I will soon be trying to get um, some of the people I know, head of political parties, on the program for interviews. After the 23rd of April, we'll start doing that. And pending whether I get to South Africa or not for the elections, um, we'll either pick the pace up or we'll do a measured pace getting to the 29 May election. I really got to get over there, but right now um, we'll see what happens. Anyway, so who else is commenting there? So what's that? Bogart? So when is UAE going to return the Guptas? Is the USA applying pressure? No. We are not applying any pressure. The United States doesn't give a flying flip about the Guptas or corruption in South Africa. However, I've penned an article which needs some editing. I was looking at it earlier this morning during a break and made several uh, edits to it, and I have to go back to the computer and fix it now. But I am penning an article about South Africa and U.S. relations uh, in the light of ANC's conduct in supporting a rogue Russian regime backing Tehran and communist China despite its genocide against the Rohingya. The inconsistency of South African ANC's claim to the moral high ground as human rights observers when actually they are human rights abusers and they are friends with tyrants, dictators, and totalitarian fascists and communists all over the planet. So this story will discuss why South Africa does not matter to the United States and why South Africans in the ANC seem to think that it does matter. It does not. Hmm. So there you go. There you go. Anyway, all right, so doesn't matter to the United States. 
you know, a lot of South Africans seem to think that South Africa is important. You know, and when I started this program, we had a lot of people who were on the far right who would come and watch the program and would claim that um, South Africa, the USA needs, the West needs South Africa because of a host of things. But we don't. Now, the only time that South Africa really becomes critically important today is when the Suez Canal is closed to traffic. Then it becomes critically important. And we saw that when a ship ran into the side of the canal and shut it down for some time. South Africa became important because of its passage around the Horn of Africa, the Southern Horn of Africa. That's why it became important. But South Africa doesn't have the means to provide maritime patrol, search and rescue properly, or any um, deterrence of its own waters, brown water or blue water. They just don't have the ability. South African Navy is pretty much a joke. So it really doesn't matter that action will actually be done by someone else like the French or the Americans or maybe the Chinese. Yeah, but the bottom line here is that South Africa is not a strategic issue for the U.S. The other argument was, well, South Africa's strategic importance to the U.S. because it's the entry point to Africa, except it isn't, ladies and gentlemen. It isn't. South Africa once upon a time was the entry point economically and in the media for all of Africa, but that's no longer the case. Nigeria, Kenya, Ethiopia, Egypt, all massive centers of commerce and entry points for the continent. So it doesn't matter in that context. So the next argument is, well, when they need our gold. Well, South Africa is not a major gold producer. What? No, ladies and gentlemen, South Africa is fluctuating between sixth and 10th percent or 10th position in global gold production annually. China is the world's largest gold producer. Yeah, inside China. And then usually after that comes USA, Australia, and Canada usually flipping order occasionally as the major gold producers, but it's not South Africa. South Africa's gold production is highly inefficient and costly at this point. So I'm getting there. I'm getting there, Bogart. So what about the platinum family of metals? They matter. They do matter, but they matter less and less. Why is that? Well, if the world actually goes to EVs, the major use for platinum-based metals, most of them, not rhodium, but platinum-based metals, most of that is used for catalytic converters to prevent pollution from internal combustion engines on automobiles. But guess what? Guess what? They want us all to fly or drive around in EVs, so we won't need catalytic converters. And that market will dry up, but that's not gonna happen anytime soon. Not gonna happen anytime soon. But platinum, South Africa's not the only source. Cobalt, South Africa's not the only source. And South Africa doesn't even have some of the more necessary needed rare earth elements. They have some, but not all of them. So the reasons that analysts incorrectly claim that South Africa is of strategic importance to the U.S. is because their mindset is during the apartheid era when the National Party government made the same argument. You need us for all those reasons, plus we're the last line of defense against encroaching communism is what they argued. And for those reasons, South Africa was able to get away with what it wanted to while the world looked away. Today, South Africa simply does not matter. It does not matter. Don't have fuel for our vessels. And she's yeah, exactly. You can just use us for nice holidays. There you go, Debbie. You can, except that when you come to South Africa, you run the risk of being carjacked, shot, robbed, raped, or murdered on holiday. And that's not an embellishment. <laughs> yeah. Our sports are dismal. Well, not the spring box. It matters because USA helped to sell us that pipe whose dream we're smoking. Uh, no. Uh, no, 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 no. Hey, look, if you allow yourself to be uh, misled, that's on you, man. That's not on us. <laughs> uh, Debbie says, never realized that. Quite sad, actually. Like, we we like to be needed. Well, we all like to be needed. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. In fact, no one needs South Africa. Yeah, I'm sorry, Miss John Dawes. I mean, I, I love South Africa, but the reality is that South Africa doesn't have the clout that it thinks it has. They just don't have the clout that they think they have, and that's a problem. People need to realize that. Be like our rhinos arrive tough and thin skin think skin i think that's how we survive yep more and more people yeah but those evs are tiny there's only a few hundreds a few thousand sold in south africa it's not changing anything anytime soon but the point is that 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 group of metals becomes less important over time and then look I'm, i've never heard anybody's feelings i mean you guys know me you know i have a great affinity for south africa but um was the crime of nrsa during part today's equally worse Oh, well, I can answer that question very directly. 
crime. Yeah, that's why they tried to be relevant with the ICJ. Well, because Tehran told them to and paid them for it. That's how they afforded their big birthday smash in Umbumbela Stadium in Nelspruit. That's how they paid off the 102 million rand that they owed to the events company. Yeah, and that's how they're running their election because somebody's giving them money, most likely the Iranians. Uh, during uh, apartheid era, how was crime? Well, Manasha, well, that's a very important distinction. The South African police during apartheid ensured that the white minority was almost completely unaffected by crime. Most white South Africans were never robbed, their homes weren't invaded, they certainly didn't face rape very often, and no one came and murdered them. Farmers were rarely attacked. It did happen, but it was rare because the government protected that minority. But crime was rife in so-called black areas during apartheid. It's always been a violent place. I mean, there's a reason why necklacing took place in KZN, primarily because of lawlessness was there. So what should have happened in 1994 is the the Mandela government should have focused on the South African police service from taking it from a force that was designed to protect the minority and shield them from crime and to oppress those who oppose the system and stamp them out. It should have taken that and turned the police force into a community policing organization that was there, that was interacting with citizens, where people were confident and trusted the police so they would report crimes or potential crimes or people acting, dod acting dodgy. And then they needed to put money into criminal prosecutions. They needed to put money into forensic handling of evidence and so on and so forth and training and retraining of the police. But that effort was never done very successfully because the SAPS fulfills a need of the ANC. Yep. It's ANC. Because they... Sorry. Their need... Sorry, I got off track. I sent a message come across. It was kind of important there. Yeah, anyway, but I lost my point of train of thought there. Sorry about that. So, Menage Kwa, what can be done about it? Well, wholesale change the South African police service. The government of the ANC must begin actually prosecuting criminals. Why has Jacob Zuma not been prosecuted for the arms deal? It occurred in the 1990s, 1996 or thereabouts to be sure. And he has been under suspicion and charges for decades now. Why hasn't Jacob Zuma been charged and given a trial in court. Well, we know why, because he fails to show up for meetings and he's in contempt of court and then cries that he's not a criminal. Yeah, no. Uh, why has Ace Magashule not been convicted or tried for, tried or convicted for the raid of dairy farm scandal? The 254 million rand asbestos deal. What about Travelgate? What about Oilgate, where ANC operatives in the government sold off South Africa's strategic oil reserve to a BE company, to a BE company, and then they were paid to manage the oil reserves, which they bought for a song. So South Africa lost a fortune in its oil reserves being sold to a private corporation, which is a politically connected black BEE company. And then that company was given a contract to manage the oil that it now owned itself. Now, isn't that amazing? Wouldn't you like to have a business and then you get paid to maintain things that you hold for the government, even though they belong to you? It's just crazy. Just absolutely crazy. So yeah, um, what about the prosecution for Pala Pala? Zandile Gumeda finally in the dock after all these years, but she draws a salary as a member of the KZN Provincial Legislature when she should be drawing no salary. Yeah, it's just crazy, folks. It's absolutely crazy. Uh, yeah, modern technology means we're more aware. How do you feel about Donald Trump comparing himself to Nelson? Uh, when did Donald Trump compare himself to Nelson Mandela Bogart? Is it because he's being persecuted? Never had fences, never had burglar bars. Exactly. There was no razor wire... You didn't have to worry about being shot. It was a very different world. But if you were black, life was tough. We had to pass laws, yep. Now they're stealing mealies from farmers, yep. Crime was always an issue in colored black and Indian communities. Exactly. Was not considered important to the apartheid regime. You are correct, Hendo, and that's what I said. It's just a failed colony that has receded back to the hands of the tribal chieftains. Hmm. I hope the song is sold. It was Baby Got Back. <laughs> Germans involved in the arms deal and other players. Oh, of course the Germans involved in the arms deal. Uh, the frigates were, or corvettes, whatever you want to call them, because the South Africans don't call them what the rest of the, the West calls them. But anyway, they were bought from a German company. The Type 209 diesel submarines bought from a German company. Yep, then the Swedes were involved with the sale of the Grippens. The Brits were involved with the sale of the Hawk lead and fighter trainers. And, and BA, BAE Systems was involved. Everybody was involved. Everybody got their cut except the South African taxpayer. Yep. Bug boats. Okay. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, it's sad, ladies and gentlemen. It's sad. So much corruption. So long. 
But Jacob Zuma says he's never stolen a needle. But the problem with that is that during the trial of Shabir Sheikh, uh, Judge Hillary Squires had the evidence and declared, based on the evidence, that Shabir Sheikh was guilty of corruption and that, by extension, Cyril Ramaphosa, who unfortunately was not on trial, not Cyril Ramaphosa, excuse me, Jacob Zuma, who unfortunately was not on trial, was also guilty of corruption because the corruption that, that the judge found in the case against Shabir Sheikh was money directly paid illicitly to Jacob Zuma. Therefore, he's also guilty. Judge Squire said that Jacob Zuma is guilty. Unfortunately, he's not before the court, and he's never been before the court. So he never will be. The octogenarian will skip by, and nothing will happen to him, because that is how South Africa works. Frank, thank you for that matter. That's how the world works these days. The criminals get away with everything. The Tucson group, yeah, that's right. Yep. Big boats, but with an accent. Oh, big boats, gotcha, okay. Yep, not bug boats, but big boats. I like big butts and I gotta say, <laughs> Sir Mix-a-Lot. Remember that? Man, what a funny song that was when it came out. Anyway, once again, folks, the breaking news today, the lead story, a former National Football League Hall of Famer, first professional football player to ever get 2,000 yards, and he did it in a 14-game season, was Ornfell James Simpson, famous for the white Bronco chase that lasted for hours as his friend Al Cowens took him home evading the police when he was wanted for arrest in connection with the murder slaying of Ron Goldman, was it Ron Goldman, and Nicole Brown Simpson, his ex-wife. That murder successfully got away with because the idiot prosecutors made Simpson try to put on a shrink, shrunken glove. Of course, the glove was shrunken because when leather gets wet, it shrinks. And so he couldn't get it on. He played big play acting. He couldn't get it on. And then Johnny Cochran famously say, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Johnny Cochran, for your nonsense. We don't really care. Grew up along South Coast. Uh, all we got along growing up in small towns, we never knew what part. Yeah, and see, Debbie, that's something that I've said before, too, and people don't believe that. Yeah, uh, well, we have multiple trials. But um, I've told people before that, and some people don't believe this, but many... A fair portion of white South Africans had no idea of apartheid because they didn't interact with folks. They weren't the ones that were oppressed and saw the impact of it. They weren't going to places where black folks lived. And their interaction with black folks was mostly confined to the housekeepers and nannies that worked in their homes and or those in the service industry, repairing cars, working at junkyards, working on farms, things like that. So they simply did not know. And people like, how do they not know? Well, how many Americans know that of 85 universities that were tested and reviewed by the Anti-Defamation League, that only two of them passed for protecting Jewish students? And one of those schools is a school with 35% Jewish enrollment. So you would think they would do it. But 13 schools, including Harvard University, famously previously led by the unqualified Claudine Gay, someone who I have better qualifications to be in charge of Harvard University than she does, because part of being that role is being an academic and being a published author. I'm a published author many times over, unlike Claudine Gay, who just has a handful of journal articles, no books. Yeah, he's still dying. Even the goodies had an apartheid episode. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Anyway. Oh, folks, I'm kind of tired. It was a short night, oh, a lot of work, but I did get it accomplished. I took care of some things. So, yeah, let me see. Uh, what have I got here? So, um, you know, I've seen the um, the mailer before. That was the early mailer. But they got some other things produced. Got an ad that went out today in the newspaper. Yep, so that's not it. The ad is here. So... Just give you a glance. That ad's gone out in the paper today. So, uh, let's see. And then here's a sneak quick peek of what's coming in the mail. Quick peek. Quick peek. That's a surprise. <laughs> That's all you get to see. That's all you get to see for now. Uh, what's the question here? Uh, next campaign event. Uh, tonight is my next campaign event, Mike, but it's not televised. It's a meet and greet with the Northern York Republican Club, which I'm a member of. They are hosting the candidates. Uh, one of the candidates will not be present. He's already told me. So we get to introduce ourselves and answer questions informally. Unfortunately for me, um, I have meetings. They scheduled this one. I have VFW meetings. So I'm going to have to go to the VFW, attend the first meeting for the board, start the second meeting with the Home Association, leave, 
and then go to this meet and greet, and then I'll come back. So, unfortunately, scheduled for tonight. Bogart gave $5 Canadian. Alex Visser says, hey, Alex, okay. Well, I say hello to Alex Visser. Thank you so much for that super chat. Canadian dollars. $5 Canadian. That's what, 33 cents U.S.? I'm just teasing. Thank you for that, Alex. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Where was that now? So what are the general topics you're hearing about? Uh, well, the problem with sharing things is that a lot of the conversation, uh, what's going on is Chatham House rules. For those unfamiliar with that, it's an academic term, a diplomatic term. Chatham House, of course, is a think tank in the UK. And the Chatham House rules are, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, essentially. So you cannot... You cannot discuss when people say Chatham House rules, it gives people the freedom to be open and disclose things. So you can't attribute them to somebody who said it. So um, you got to be circumspect about what you say because people know who are in the group. And if you say certain things, it's going to be obvious where the information came from. But we've talked a lot about Ukraine. We've talked a lot about China, a lot about Russia. Um, I've talked a bit about Africa to try to keep that in the conversation. Yeah, it's like a closed house. Um, so Chatham House rules, when they're in effect, you know, and it's like, it's like you know, it's, there's things in the diplomatic community that <clears throat> you just, these phrases you become accustomed to hearing and mechanisms you become accustomed to adhering to, Chatham House rules. So like, for instance, I heard something this morning that happened, uh, U.S. liberals are the generous ones. Us liberals. Huh? Liberals are not generous. Conservatives are generous. People, generous people of faith are generous. They're the ones that build the Lutheran charities, the ones who build the Catholic schools and hospitals, Lutheran hospitals. People of faith who are largely conservative but not exclusively. Now, liberals are not generous. Liberals steal our money, and they claim to be generous by giving our money to other people. Fight Club. Well, it might feel like Fight Club tonight there, Menashe Kwa. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> so Chatham House rules. <clears throat> So I heard some things today about uh, President Obama. Someone in the group uh, talked about President Obama, but uh, I won't disclose what was said because the Chatham House rules. Um, if it had been a larger audience, I could say what was said, but without giving you know details away. But ex exposing what was said in the conversation would uh, expose what came from. So you have to protect that. People um, will not be forthcoming and forthright and share information that's of a discreet and... Um, important nature if they can't speak freely so yep so chat about rules another thing is you get diplomats who are lazy so when you do a diplomatic event i'd like to thank the uh, an ambassador from turkey for being present today and the chinese ambassador as well as the minister of sport and foreign affairs yada 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 that is you know but you know there's so many people to greet and thank when you do those things all times eventually what happens <coughs> excuse me is that <coughs> excuse me the diplomats speaking will eventually saying all protocols observed in other words you know i'm lazy thank you all <laughs> all protocols observed because there are certain protocols for greeting people and identifying people at events when you have diplomats there yep anyway so yeah obama rama and big mike <laughs> big mike thing is still hanging around there nobody's letting go of that nobody's letting go of that big mike thing thanks for the two super chats canadian um, so I know what the exchange rate is right now. It's about three quarters of a dollar per Canadian dollar. So there was a while there, not too long ago, the Canadian dollar reached parity with the U.S. dollar, and actually was for the first time ever. I think slightly ahead. Uh, all right. So anyway, there you have it. Oh, folks, um, lots going on here. But my next event is tonight, and it's not my last event. It's the last one in which multiple candidates will be going to. We've not been invited to anything else. It's been a long haul, actually. We had the so-called debate on March 13th. It just started to rain. Uh, we had um, another event at the Lighthouse Baptist Church. That was a candidate forum. We did one online for the Dillsburg Area Residents for Reasonable Growth. That's one of the groups in our district. And what else? We did uh, some others. I'm trying to remember what they were. But all oh, we did the uh, Right Minded Women event. That one happened. Uh, that was when I was sick. I didn't feel very well at all. I was shocked that I could even stand up and talk that day. I was feeling very under the weather. But anyway, so I don't think anybody knew that except me. But it wasn't my best performance. But the rest of them, I think I performed pretty well. So the, day, the event we had the other night, obviously U.S. intelligence doesn't extend cultural topics. If you don't know it, the works of the goodies them up 
uh, Alter Bridge, U.S. intelligence does know about U.K., Australian cultural topics. <laughs> yes, and many Americans know them as well. Uh, our television in, are inextricably linked. Our banking systems are inextricably linked. Our diplomatic relations are inextricably linked. And people know very well about the U.K. and about Australia as well. In fact, there's an Australian general here at the event this week. Um, Bill Audi is a weird guy. He's a creepy looking guy and I've never been a fan. So, yep, never been a fan. So I didn't recognize or mention your comment about the Audis. I do not care for the guy. He's a weirdo. Anyway, that's my thought. He's popular in the UK though. But anyway, lots of people are popular that aren't necessarily people that I would want to associate with. Nothing against him. Just night. Pip Jacob saying good night. Wow, you're going to bed earlier. What's going on here? It must only be seven almost seven p.m. seven thirty what's going on there get some rest anyway 47 likes you can hear the train in the background hopefully making a lot of noise uh, still an extensive round network and the word Palestine comes from yes correct yes yes Judea yeah, Judea that is what is incorrectly known as the West Bank today yeah no but I'm not a big fan of his anyway um, yeah so before I got off track there, what was I talking about? Anyway. Yeah, so we did all these events for the election, and um, it becomes exhausting at some point. And on top of that, I still have my responsibilities, trying to save the VFW from going out of business, despite the fact that some people are sabotaging it. And um, also, it's a difficult time economically for a lot of people who don't have resources to go out like they normally do. And dealing with other issues there. So that's still going on. My broadcasting still takes place. I've got other things I've got to plan for, other commitments to take care of. And it's all very exhausting. I'm my own campaign manager. I'm my own campaign finance manager because I'm not taking donations. All of that takes time. Last night, I submitted my financial report to the state because you are legally required to disclose your expenditures, your your income that came in, donations, where they came from, and so on. So... Um, my financial reports would probably make uh, everybody except the ANC Blanche because my reports for the campaign are all in the negative because no one's giving me any money. Go eat, drink something, and then you will be able to refocus and re-energize. Yeah, I do need that, Charles. I'm I'm not energized and I'm not focused right now, but it's probably because I am hungry and I'm tired. But yeah, uh, I'm not too happy with the food here that's available, so I'll probably skip it and get something somewhere else, but I still have work to do here. I can't really run off yet, but I do have things to do this afternoon. But the good news is I got through... <clears throat> my updated final mailer. I got my sign put together that I'm going to put out, a big sign. And then I also took care of my news advert. So that's all good news. And um, I'm excited about that. Also, I ordered some hats. I'm waiting for those. All families have them. What's this? Okay. Thanks for the stream. Good luck for later. And Hester's leaving. Everybody's leaving. It's not even an hour. What's going on tonight? Did I start too late for y'all? It's funny because people tell me I should start this program later, but then I do it later and people just leave early. <laughs> What's that all about? <laughs> yeah, no, it's it, I guess you guys, are, it's looking pretty obvious. I'm kind of run down and my batteries are low. That's uh, a lot of uh, achieve amidst your busy schedules. Well, thank you for that, Debbie. Yeah. No, they had, they, 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 we have that stuff, you know, it's, anyway, um, yeah, no, it's, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, <clears throat> God bless it. <clears throat> I can't get that to come out. So, I come up with a concept for my campaign products, my signs, my yard signs, my mailers, and all of that, my advertisements. The advertisements, I design them exclusively because I'm not paying an outside person to do it. Uh, I am paying for the palm cards and for my yard signs. I come up with a concept. I give it to the graphic artist, and that graphic artist is amazing. Takes my concept and really improves on what I wanted to do and fulfills what I had in my mind, but I was incapable of putting on paper. So that's pretty cool. Um, supper arrived. Steak, baked potato, and salad. Okay. Uh, Garrett says a lot of support from his crew. Well, thank you for that, Garrett. I really do appreciate the support. Um, I need a lot of support here in central Pennsylvania, though, if I want to win this race. So we're working on that. Undercover blonde. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot going on. So. Alrighty, folks, rather than drag this out, Dallas time. Oh, that's one hour behind here. They're on Central Time. I'm not sure what you guys are getting at. That's some kind of inside joke. But I'm going to, what's this? Um, now, how much time is needed to run an effective campaign? Well, Benajah Qual, that's a difficult question to answer because it depends on the level of the office. I mean, if you're running for township supervisor, you really only need to hit a small area. But this is an area that's 
square mileage, thousands, must be thousands of square miles. I mean, I have put 8,000 kilometers on my car for this campaign. And I just loaded up fuel again yesterday, it was $50. Bosch Zebra, get yourself a lekker cup of coffee. Yeah, there you go. Hey, how's it going, Bosch Zebra? Yeah, um, so it just depends. Uh, if I was just running for a local borough, I'd only have to deal with a few hundred people who vote, and that's it. So thank you for the super chat, man. 350 rand. That's awesome. That's going to that's gonna pay for a coffee and then some. But uh, in an area this size, it takes a lot of time. And uh, I don't know how to say what the amount of, right amount of time is because I'm, I'm competing against so many people. I mean, if I had no opponents, I was running unopposed in the primary it would be actually you know it's it's probably good that i have so many opponents because it's it's not that i would have been lazy but it's really forced me to hit the ground running and continue sprinting the whole time so as a consequence i just keep going and going kind of like the energizer bunny or like a timex it takes a licking and keeps on ticking <laughs> timex commercials yeah um so that's just really pushed me train to background when i trains yeah it's yeah the trains uh, they're all around here so you know, the dog days election cycle. That's true, Mike. But it forces me to keep going and keep meeting people and keep getting my name out there so that people hear what I'm about, where I'm from, and what my positions are. If I didn't have an opponent in the primary, there's a chance I might be less motivated to work so hard. Knowing myself, that might not happen, but it is. it's not the time you just betrayed yourself as a goodies hater. <laughs> Alter Bridge. I never said I was a goodies hater. I just said I don't like Bill Adi. <laughs> Do you like the Chieftains? Do you like the Chieftains? Tell me if you like the Chieftains there, Alter Bridge. <laughs> well, ouchie was anti Chieftains. What about Flock of Seagulls? The Chieftains, of course, are an Irish folk band, and the Flock of Seagulls are a new wave band from the early 90s. And I ran. I ran so far away, couldn't get away. Yeah. Wow, that was that was a fun time, the 1980s, man. 1980s, the best decade ever, hands down. No one can convince me of anything else. It is a statement of fact. Yeah, so anyway, um, it's difficult to answer how much time. New shoes, uh, yeah, I, using the same fellies that I bought in South Africa. So these are the Sia Khaleesi editions. They're supposed to be green, but they're looking a little less green there. But uh, these I picked up in, I want to say Stellenbosch at the at the uh, flagship store, but they didn't have my size. So I picked them up in Somerset West when I went down to meet Barry Hilton. I watched his son play soccer as I met Barry and his wife down there. And I left there and went to the shopping center not too far from there in Somerset West. And they have a store inside the big shopping mall, and they did have a pair that fit me, got my size. So um, I have two pair of these. These are from Freedom of Movement, FOM, the South African-based company. And I'm also wearing not just the fellies from South Africa, but also wearing South African socks. These are, Vil 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 I don't know if I can do this. Wildebeest, there you go, Wildebeest socks. <laughs> That's probably not something you're banking on seeing in this show. But here are the Freedom, <coughs> God bless <clears throat> Freedom of Movement, fellas. You can see the stamped into the leather right there. Yep, these things are awesome, but they are not great for long-term wear when you're walking a lot because they don't offer quite the support that I'd love to have. It says, made in South Africa, May 3rd of 2023. That's when these were manufactured. Isn't that cool? Right there on the inside of the shoe. Freedom of Movement. But, uh, yep, so that's what I'm wearing. Uh, but that's the only South African stuff I'm wearing today. No other South African kit. Uh, the rest of the stuff comes other places around the world, including the shirt, the tie. Met Barry at Jan Smuts in the 80s before he became famous. Hey, Christine, I met Barry after he became famous. Uh, I went to his comedy program at Somerset West. It was brilliant. Uh, Joe Emilio was opening act for him. Then I met him outside, and then I did an interview with Barry, which was pretty cool. And, of course, uh, they tried that. The racist tried to, race hustlers tried to keep Barry from doing the interview with me. What the heck is that? Tried to keep Barry from doing the interview with me, and um, his manager, which is his wife, contacted me and asked questions because they were lying about me, calling me a racist and other nonsense, so that he wouldn't do the interview. And uh, Barry's not a coward, so he did the interview. He's a comedian. It was fantastic. Now, unfortunately, what happened with um, the stakes were much higher for Nas Bota, and when the racist and black supremacist and white liberal scumbags lied about me, um, and Super Sport became involved in the conversation during the Rugby World Cup, well, I lost my interviews with 
Nas Blota. And in fact, Nas has not been communicating with me for some time now. I hope that's not an indication because we had a very good cordial relationship. And our conversations, quite frankly, if you're an objective observer, were quite like a, about rugby. I mean, as an American who approaches rugby from my American viewpoint, having played rugby in Africa and been a Springbok supporter all along, um, that combined with one of the most famous and successful rugby players in all history, Nas Bota, with the South African viewpoint, really made for fascinating conversations. I'm biased because I'm the guy that I'm talking about, but I'm also talking about Nas. And so I don't know how you all feel, but I know Hendo love those conversations. Yep. Anyway. So his wife was in my math class. Oh, okay, she's a nice lady. What did Polly say? Saul Barry had a heart attack. What? I didn't know that. All right, then, Barry. My goodness, thank you for that, Polly. Uh, did you ever talk to Nas about? I did, Menage Qua. I did talk about his experience in the National Football League. We did. So my first interaction with Nas Bolta was an interview in Bloemfontein, which um, was fantastic. Um, I think that might have been set up by, by um, uh, my viewer there in Pretoria who set that up. And then um, the combination was set up by Chris Marie, and it worked out really well. I went to great college, and I interviewed him before I left. Uh, Bogart says, I don't like your politics. I like you as a person. Well, Bogart, thank you. What do you don't like about my politics? Um, you don't like treating people equally and fairly. You don't like an objective approach to everyone is equal. No one's better than anyone else. You don't. Maybe you prefer government solving people's problems rather than people solving problems. That might be where political differences come from. But thank you for saying you don't like my politics, but you'd like me personally. It's very kind of you. I appreciate that. Well, not 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 saying you don't like my politics. <laughs> I think people misunderstand. Very windy when you stick your head. I think that what uh, Erica is saying is that um, when you make yourself out there, people come after you. I love your nos, both the chats, and wonder why they stop. Uh, well, Sue, it's because a scumbag uh, who claims to be a South African who was living in Amsterdam but now claims to be living in the Eastern Cape or Western Cape, I don't know where, um, claimed to have contacted Supersport and claimed that uh, Nas was doing broadcasts with a racist, uh, white supremacist, KKK member, all slander and lies, uh, and then attacked my broadcast because the man has penis envy. And so it's just a shame. So Nas... Um, contacted me shortly after that um, and said that uh, Super Sport had said that it's it's in his contract that he couldn't do a broadcast with anyone else. Well, I don't know what they're talking about. This is just someone's YouTube channel and really it's a shame. But anyway, so, um, you know, people, these, these leftist scumbags who've accomplished little in their lives love to destroy other people. We all had an incredible, oh, you have no idea, Sue Walsh. And it doesn't just stop there. I had the lunatic wackadoodle down under lie to people and said that I'm a CIA agent. That undermined my support from people who are with Sightlanders, uh, who, some of whom believe that nonsense because they're obviously incapable of critical thinking on their own. So that affected my program. Um, the hate wanker from Amsterdam who claims to be South African got pissed off at me because I defended Steve Hofmeyer when Steve was attacked because... I wasn't really defending Steve Hofmeyer. I was defending um, the truth. Steve Hofmeyer was booked on a cruise, and he was supposed to perform on a ship that was going to Namibia, a, a Dutch cruise company. And this person led a campaign against him because he doesn't like Steve Hofmeyer because he thinks Steve Hofmeyer is a racist. Steve Hofmeyer is not a racist, at least not from his public declarations. Uh, he's just someone who defends Alpha Connor cultural rights. Yeah, the world this this World Cup chaps were fantastic. Um, but the bottom line here is that. I've been attacked by the clowns from down under. I've been attacked by black supremacists and white liberals in South Africa and in UK. Hang on a second. High performance military aircraft flying overhead. Oh yeah. Oh, that's not military. That, that might actually be Arctic. That wasn't a military aircraft. That was a private jet for the Ritchie people. That might be Arctic flying people around, land going to Harrisburg. I don't have to check with Arctic and see where he's at. He's not in the air. That was actually, that was not a high performance. That was a, that was a private uh, business jet that just flew overhead. So that was interesting. Uh, is there an end game to the load shedding? Uh, no, the load shedding is the new normal and has been for a couple of years because the ANCs 
stuff the state-owned enterprise, which is a mistake to begin with. These should be private companies running the power grid. There should be multiple of them. That's the first problem. Second problem is that they've stolen the money that should have been invested in keeping the infrastructure rolling, the grid upgraded. They haven't done it. They foolishly shut down coal-fired power plants because they're cowards and they want the grift from the West. And so all of that plus corrupt contracts, theft, it's going to be there for a while. Oh, George Carlin will be received very poorly today. He can never say, you know, there are five words you can, you can, you can, you know, can never say, you know, like you know, crap, piss, you know, and F and all this other stuff. Yeah, George Carlin would not go over very well. You know, Chris Tucker's comedy doesn't even go over well anymore because people are just scumbag woke artists and they fraudulently perceive things. They just make life boring and dull. Comedy is hilarious and, you know, people become the butt of jokes, but it's not mean spirited. So anyway, what did Bosch say? Uh, what did Bosch say? Karen Kruger, Rolf Strigoli, and a few other famous players. Okay. I don't know what Bosch ever said. It wasn't showing up here. Anyway, so, yeah. Um, yeah, the NAS both, the thing went sideways. It's a shame because Nas and I get along really well. I interviewed him at person in Bloemfontein, then I interviewed him online multiple times, and then we did the World Cup stuff, and it was a lot of fun. And someone just had to ruin the party. It kind of really put a damper on my World Cup experience because with not being part of my World Cup experience, I wasn't alone in France. I had a, a companion. Nas was in South Africa, but he was a companion because we chatted it every night after and we and I recorded those and then uploaded them or broadcast them live, whichever the case was. Really a shame. Really, really a shame. And Nas was not being utilized by Super Sports, so it made it even worse. So Nas struck back. And he, I guess he's allowed to do his own broadcast and start his own channel. and got support for that, which is good for him. Yeah, the bantering was a lot of fun between Nas and I. And it wasn't, I like Senator Hawley. He does not, yeah, Senator Hawley's like me. He doesn't, he doesn't pull any punches when, you know, I mean, why, why would you, why, why would you mislead people? Just tell the truth about what's going on. I mean, that's, that's, that's what people should do. You know, now, that doesn't mean you have to be caustic and throw grenades in the room, pull the pin and throw the grenade. Like, Marjorie Taylor Greene does on occasion, but you know what? She's in such a cesspool, it might just be necessary to do that sometimes. Uh, the fact that the interview with Nas was quite spectacular and well done. Well, thank you for that, Bosch Zebra. I couldn't find your comment. Yeah, I thought they were spectacular and very professional, but of course, you know, the nascent budding effort was going on there, destroyed by leftists. And why? Because corporate leadership is comprised of cowards, absolute cowards. But listen, I, I look, I don't blame Nas. Nas is a good guy, and Nas owed me nothing. He didn't have to do those chats with me, but they were really lucky. I mean, Nas, of course, was caught up in that stupid, uh, you know, controversy a few years ago with a former colored South African springbok who has very thin skin. Um, yeah. Oh, Mike, I know Nas is bothered by it too. That's why I don't throw any stones at Nas. But, I mean, you know, I hope that it doesn't ruin our relationship because we had a good professional relationship and I really enjoyed it. So, anyway, but it's just a shame that it happened. And then in the midst of this, of course, don't forget that it wasn't just Nas. I was also attacked. And I suspect the attack was prompted by hate wankers who are have penis envy at my interview skills and my color commentary. Because remember that I recorded my own video footage. I have the original data file of where it's recorded, I can prove the provenance of my broadcast. And I did highlights and I did comments. I did not take content from World Rugby at all, but I was viciously attacked by World Rugby, or claiming to be World Rugby, who gave me one strike, then gave me another strike for my content that I recorded, my analysis. Nobody from World Rugby, no television commentators from Supersport, no one from anywhere. It was me. There was no background music being played, and I got copyright strikes two of them and nearly lost my rugby ascended program which i've spent three years building i've flown all over the world to cover the cover of the sevens tournament in london in vegas i have been to south africa to cover united rugby championship and curry cup games as well as international test matches and to the uk for that as well and that channel nearly disappeared over bogus strikes because i was issued a third strike and if i had not begun to combat the ones that were about to expire but hadn't expired because it was an intentional effort to sabotage my youtube channel which i put thousands of if not tens of thousands of dollars into bringing rugby to america and the world and listen, I may not be the best rugby broadcaster, but I will tell you this. I will tell you this. 
There's a lot of people that like my accent that come from elsewhere around the world and love my American focus on rugby. They find it very interesting. A lot of people also enjoy the enthusiasm of me doing my broadcast. I'm not claiming they're the best, not even remotely the best. I mean, Hugh, uh, Hugh uh, Blanton is the gold standard for me, but I'm not going to get lit to do my broadcast. I love Hugh Blanton's broadcast of rugby. It really drew me into rugby. But you know what? People like it, so I do it. And I was unfairly targeted by supposedly, purportedly world rugby. But here's the thing. It was my content. And that I was attacked for stealing trademark. That's not That's not even a copyright thing. That's a trademark thing. Because on my banners promoting the World Cup, from Hugh, Bla Hugh Bladen. Did I say Blanton? Hugh Bladen. Thank you for the correct I said Blanton. Sorry, I'm tired. Hugh Bladen. That guy's just, <laughs> I love that. Hugh, Hugh Bladen covering the rugby. That guy's voice is awesome. And then I can't understand Kosa, but I enjoy turning, tuning in sometimes to, in South Africa to the Kosa broadcast of rugby because they really make it exciting. Total victimization over jealousy. I'm convinced. Pure sour grapes. Exactly, Debbie, but it works. It works. Um, those shows originally introduced me to you. Uh, okay, Mike, cool. They have beard envy. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Anyway, thank you all for your support. Yeah, Hugh Blade, Christine. That's the guy, man. That's the guy. I don't have TV, so the only way we get rugby, we loved it. Flip, you kept us on the edge of our seats. I tried, yep. Too many haters out there. Alex brought me a special chili brew. Okay. All right, well, folks, I'm going to need to wrap it up here. I appreciate everybody sticking with me for a long time. And thanks for chatting with me about rugby because, you know, I love the game of rugby. Always fun to talk about it. Um, looking forward to – I have to take a look and see. I might be able to do a game this Saturday. We'll see. Um, of course, it would be Stormers or Bulls. That would be my focus unless the only guy I can schedule is something else. But the Sharks are back. They finally have righted their ship. That's uh, good news for for South African rugby, bad news for the Stormers and for the Bulls if the Sharks are playing serious. But it's a bit too late to salvage this season. Maybe in the Challenge Cup they can pull something off. But anyway, folks, thanks for being here. Thanks for the super chat revenue that came in. Really do appreciate that on this live broadcast from my mobile. I'm going to take off for now, and I'll catch you guys later. All right? And you guys have a lovely evening, and thank you so much. Be sure to hit the like button. Don't forget that. And we'll catch you next time right here on Chris White Reports. Cheers, everybody.